Welcome to Take the Helm Podcast, where we will share stories, experiences, data, and best practices with industry leaders, friends, and dealers. From market conditions to insights, leadership development to tough conversations, take the helm. Right, good day, everybody. John Green here with Lead Helm. And if you watch any of these, you know I'm always excited for these. And I have multiple reasons for excitement today. So the first one, right, at the time of this recording, we're just a couple days into spring, right? So what does spring mean? Spring means the flowers are blooming and the sales are booming. How about that, right? <laughs> I thought about that one this morning. <laughs> so I'm excited about that, right? We're in season. This is the, the exciting time for people in, in power sports and so forth and consumers, right? Everybody's getting antsy, right? Break out of the winter and go do something fun. Be on the trails, be on the water, be on the road, be somewhere. So that's super cool. Uh, yeah, you know, other reason. You know, that's when that's when everybody comes out of the closet. You know, they're they're ready to start riding and they're hoping that the weather continues. OK, so. It's exciting That's right. Time. Everybody's going to the same weather. We, yes, we, gotta, we have to will the good weather to come, right? At least where I am, I'm in Greenville, South Carolina, and it is in full spring, right? I hear a lot of bikes on the road right now. You can hear them, you can feel them. Uh, the water's a little chilly, so we don't see a lot of watercraft activity just yet. But people are getting ready, so we're excited about that. And as usual, we're talking about Lead Helm. We're talking about how do we sell more vehicles and deliver an exceptional customer experience all through better digital lead management and the use of technology. So when we can talk about selling more product and making people happy, everybody wins. Manufacturers win, dealer win, we win, customer wins, everybody wins. So we're talking about winning. That's exciting. Um, I'm going to introduce my guests here in a second because that's even another level of enthusiasm because we have we have a different crew today. and. The topic, before I do an introduction, if you've watched these, right, so this is the ninth, um, the ninth one of these, the ninth episode uh, that, that we've done of this, and, and we cover a lot of topics, right? Sometimes we're talking about uh, releases or new features to Lead Helm in and of itself as a platform. Most of the time we're talking about how do we continue to take advantage and capitalize on the opportunity that is digital business, right? And whether that means digital traffic logs or looking at the digital journey through the eyes of the customer and how do we optimize our website and any of those topics. And today is a little bit different, right? Because you got to think about our everyday lives at Lead Helm in particular, right? We're talking to our clients on a daily basis. We're talking to prospective clients, dealers on a daily basis. We're talking to OEMs with great frequency. And we spend a lot of time with other uh, industry providers, I would say, whether that's CRM companies or DMS companies or mystery shop companies or 20 club companies, whatever the case is. So we're interacting with players at all different levels inside of the power sports and Harley Davidson space, and including some automotive and some marine in there as well. I don't want to leave those out. And what we're finding is, and we're going to share today, there's there's some new thinking and, and what we're going to call a new way that we're seeing the front end of the business needing to be managed. Okay. So we'll get into more detail about that in a minute. But anyway, so today I have with me Aaron Barney. AB, co-founder of Lead Helm and I don't know, you and Scott, 20, this will be your 21st year together. Is that right? Yeah. Well, 21 years in June, Scott. So time flies. You're having fun and it's good. And so you'll, you guys know Aaron from all the way through every department almost in the dealerships, including internet and dealer lead, uh, digital lead performance, right? We had DLP, so forth. So Aaron brings unbelievable uh, knowledge and experience in, in this space. So always great to have AB yeah. there. Just tell, just, yeah. just tell that story the other day, John, you know, just to somebody and like, how did you, you know, just I was talking to somewhere I was, I said, how did you get in that business? I said, well, I, you know, I rode dirt bikes. And I said, and then I, you know, I saw I could, I could go get my dirt bike parts cheap because, you know, if you're riding dirt bikes, you're always... Your eyes have to buy something. parts and work on them. So <laughs> that I think it was only a couple of days, I think, after I started working that parts counter, I met Scott and thought, man, this is I can make a career out of this. So here we are. That's right. Look at you now. Ah, very cool. And Scott Fisher, 
right? Scott Fisher, longtime friend, business partner, mentor, all around motorcycle guy, good guy. Been doing this for, I don't know, Scott, 30 plus years in, in this area, right? We won't just call it as, as motorcycle dealer, but certainly as a dealer, owner, operator, different positions work in metric and in, in Harley, um, so forth. So Scotty, what's, how are you? You just, your most recent big adventure was, uh, was Daytona, I believe. Yeah. Bike week was really, uh, you know, um, well, anyhow, thanks for the introduction. Um, bike Good. week was really fun this year. Uh, you know, many years, you know, 37 years, the Harley dealer in Fort Myers, 37 years, you know, um, Harley dealer with other, other dealerships around the country, but we, obviously we went to um, bike week many times with customers. Uh, you go downtown to, you know, main street and, you know, I don't have to tell everybody what you do when you go to main street and uh, at bike week, but you have a lot of fun, but I will tell you <laughs> that, you know, my, my roots come from riding off road, racing motocross, racing enduros, racing hair scrambles. And we went to the supercross at Daytona this year. And, I was quite frankly just completely blown away and revived on why I love the business the way I love the business because you know the 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 supercross had this incredible um well first of all it was packed it was it, it was the biggest biggest attendance they've ever had and I think it's a lot to do with how supercross has been marketed in the last couple of years you know it's great television um viewing today as compared to what it used to be. So more people were exposed to it, but it was really a lot of young families and young kids and they were everywhere and much different than what's down on Main Street. You know, Main Street, I felt at home. Uh, at Supercross, I felt like, you know, I was um, a little bit, uh, you know, outside of the demographic, but but it was really something special. And I'd, I'd like to just go back and, and just say, you know, I'm 37 years of Harley dealer and, and uh, and uh, thir 13 years prior to that as a non-Harley dealer. And, um, but I did meet Aaron Barney when he came to town. He was only about 18 years old. I maybe even, I don't know if he was 18 or 17, but he was young and, and, um, and we were very fortunate to have Aaron come on board because he had, he was a great example of what, you know, I, I believe I tell people all the time, make your, make your passion your career. And, you know, my passion was motorcycles. And quite frankly, um, you know, when the, when the ability to be a competitive racer runs out, you know, um, you still love the product. And what better way to love the product than to get in the product and share your experience with other people and continue to continue to roll the product out. And Aaron is a great example of that as well. So um, I'm, I'm excited to be here today and, and excited on what what we're doing today with Lead Helm, how we're how we're still we're still very very involved in leading, um, you know, um, our our business, leading, trying to lead the industry and trying to help our customers um, get on get their butts on saddles quicker. Yeah. Well, it's it's funny. It, it's not funny. It causes me to to really think in a in a bigger in a bigger way right when you talk about that supercross event right and you you had told me some stories about that even in more detail than what you just shared right here right younger people families that are there and so forth and and what we sometimes forget in this business is we're not just selling product right we're actually this is a community and this is a lifestyle and and those of you that are in dealerships on the front line every day, and this was one of our core values inside of Scott Fisher Enterprises in our stores all the time, right? We have the ability through great service and unbelievable product that we're able to sell. We have the ability to influence and change people's lives with this product. Yeah. Right? Because they, they get in the boat, they get on the dirt bike, they get on the side by side, right? Whatever, whatever they're on, and all of a sudden they go out, and now they're out in the world, and they've got different friends, different things that are happening. It really is something powerful. I think sometimes we we lose sight of that, right? Because retail's a grind, right? We all know it really, really well, and you got to execute the minutia every day with a level of passion and energy that's hard to find sometimes. Sometimes when you feel, but it's hard to find, you got to step back and really look at the impact 
of what we do and what we sell can actually have on people. So that's a good one, Scott. I'm glad you you put me in a, in a good in a good mind a mind frame for for moving this forward. So, uh, so the topic today really is the, a new way to think about the front end of our business. Okay, so I want to talk about the front end, right? The sales and finance here. We're not going to talk so much about finance today, but the sales end of it in negotiable priced goods, vehicle selling. So if this is an RV, if this is a boat, if this is a car, if this is anything inside of Power Sports and Harley, this is applicable thinking right here. And we're not, because I want to make very clear on this, we're not inventing a new way, right? We're just reporting on what we're seeing through these varied lenses that we have, right? So you've got... We've got almost 40 years of experience as operators inside of power sports. So that's one lens, right? We had three years of running digital lead performance, right? Where we had a team of agents that handled on behalf of dealers, handled over a million leads, worked those leads, engaged with a customer, built value, moved to a set appointment on behalf of the dealer. So we see it through that lens. And now we're about a year and a half in market with Lead Helm as a as a software as a subscription product, and we look very specifically through this digital lead management lens right now. So we're kind of bringing an update on what we're seeing from all those from all those different areas. And it again, we're not creating this. This is the evolution that the customer is creating. Okay. Dealers are changing some faster than others because customers are mandating a different way to shop and they're right. I don't care what their decision is. If the customer decides they're going to go one way, we have to be ready to go with them as, as dealers. And in this, this really comes down to, to me, I think something that this is applicable to any business, not just the segments that we're talking about right now, but, you have to continually reinvent yourself as a business to stay relevant and to continue to stay competitive and successful, okay? Now, I'm not saying you change all the product and so forth, but we always have to be mindful and willing to look at a different way or a new way if that's what the market demands. And that's really what we're, we're gonna share today. So I wanna, I wanna go back to you on this one for a minute, Scott. So in all these years of, of, of owning and operating these stores, different stores, different states, so on and so forth, talk to me about some things that, that you can recall that were big shifts, right? And how you thought about the business or systems or technology or approaches that you use to business that we might use as, as analogies or comparables to kind of what we're seeing right now. Hmm. Well, you know, I think, probably the biggest evolution was really the traffic ball. I mean, I think, I think in it, I think there's a whole lot of things that we could talk about the whole lot of items that we talk about, but the one thing that we know for sure, and I think everybody out there that's perhaps watching um, this podcast is realizes that, um, you know, the money's in the metal. And we can do all the work we want to do to build our service departments and build our parts departments. And it's really, really important. But if we don't sell motorcycles, it just doesn't matter. So, you know, the motorcycle sales side of the business is very complicated because one, it's got the biggest dollar volume of product that, 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 that our business has. Um, it, it's, it has been over the years very difficult to get the product or very difficult to move the product. So it changes, it changes based on the industry. But, but more than anything was, how do we provide the greatest customer experience? And the traffic log did a couple of things. One, it showed us how much we needed the right amount of, of um, sales teams in order to provide the greatest level of service for the customer. But at the same time, it allowed, allowed us to evaluate the sales team on their performance. You know, we always said forever, let the data drive it. Okay, so data is very important. And it couldn't be more exposed today with digital. Because digital, there's no, there's, there's, the information is really correct. You know, the data comes through digitally and nobody can really hide that data. But I think that, you know, when we look at, 
when we look at how the traffic laws allowed us to look at advertising, how it allowed us to look at um, staffing, how it allowed us to look at, at training, how, how it allowed us to look at um, the days of the week, the type of, the type of, of, of um, staffing of, of sales team, the days of the week. It's just unbelievable what's happened there. So, so you know, I, I'd love to talk about lots of other stuff because there are so much other stuff in the finance department and, and, and the um, marketing side of the business, how we integrated service and parts to help sell motorcycles. But really, it's around the sales staff and, and the data that is, is um, brought through the traffic law. And of course, now it's brought, it's brought not only through the traffic law, but it's also brought through the digital side of the business. Yeah, and so thank you. Scott, for that, I'm going to I'm going to ask you a quick question on that in, in a second, Aaron. But I think what's interesting is what we're seeing now that, that fits very well with the discussion today is that level of data and the insights provided that you just talked about for the for the showroom floor. We now see as an absolute necessity in digital. OK. That same level of intensity and scrutiny and detail with our digital business as we typically would apply on the floor, that now is, it's not an option, quite honestly. It's a necessity. So I want to go back to the traffic log. So Aaron, in your time through with Scott through all these years as sales manager, right, let's reflect for a minute on the size of what our big traffic logs and how big those things used to be, the paper ones. Do you remember oh, those man. really well? They got I actually, long. Yeah. I miss more, them. I record more stuff. I gotta tell you, I, I actually, I actually miss them. You know, I, I don't. I think <laughs> that I think that there's probably not a day in my life that I don't, I don't forget, forget about those things. We had a nice metal podium. You know, we had it positioned in a nice area in the, in the dealership, and you had the you had the long traffic logs. I don't know if you can see me on the screen, but those things were, you know, these long sh sheets, and you know, we would. Uh, this is this is interesting because this is before we really even had really the like minimal technology, right, Scott? Like we didn't, we really didn't even log customers into anywhere. You know, we really mm -hmm. didn't, we really didn't have, you know, and it's, it's, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, you go up to that podium and you fill it out and you know, hey, you know, the, the rule behind that, right, John was, if it wasn't in the traffic log, it didn't happen. Didn't happen. Right? And, you know, we, we were logging that, you know, the, the guy and his wife came with the red and blue hat. You know, we, 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 it was, uh, it was the most important thing as Scotty always, you always said, it was, it's the heartbeat of the dealership, you know, yes. and you get to, you get to influence so many things behind that. And, and, and for us, I think Scott Fisher Enterprises, it was, you know, yeah. How do you, how do you maximize sales? But it was always with the, with the lens of, you know, where are we at with the customer experience? What is this data telling us that we can do to help the, the customer experience? I remember the first time we started doing dealer tours, you know, so, yeah, no, I miss those big paper traffic logs. Those were, those were, uh, those are the good, the good old days. This is the same time that your cycle trader, trader, trader rep would come in, and he'd be selling you, you know, how big of a space you want on the page, you know, and you're trying to pick up what bikes you want to put on there, man. This is some good old days there. Scott, so, you got so something. John, we got. I wanted to comment on what Aaron said there. You know, um, it's it's um, two things. You know, he talked about the paper traffic log. You know, it started out as a regular sheet of paper and literally our traffic logs got, you know, four feet wide. You know, why did they get four feet wide? Because we kept uncovering more and more things that we needed to, um, to really uh, uh, look at the data of the customer or the sales process. And it allowed us the key item. How do we train salespeople and how do we hold them accountable you know, we want salesmen to repeat certain things over and over all the time. And, you know, salespeople need somebody to hold them accountable. I mean, the first step of success is I'm going to help lead and train my sales team. The second thing is, is let's hold them accountable. And the only way you can really hold sales team accountable is through real data. Because, you know, they can tell you anything. You know, they can tell you anything. It's like when they bring a deal a worksheet to the desk and and it and it says I got a customer on here who will pay you know half price for this motorcycle but there's nothing written on it. You know, we used to say, look, I can hear you but I can't see shit. 
Okay, so go get me a deal and bring it back. And then we'll talk about it. Well, the reason why I'm saying this is because one of the things that is so critical today is we're not yet really managing the data properly in the digital space. I mean, we're just not. We're, we're almost like we were before the traffic laws. You know, we're rock, round robbing them out to the sales team. There's no real accountability to what happened to those customers online. There's no different than those customers that walk through the front door. I don't care what anybody says today. That customer that goes online is just like a guy walking through the door because they're in their journey. They're, they're in their journey. They didn't just happen to fall on our website just like they didn't just happen to get lost and walk through our front door. So it's really important. I mean, you, you know, you, you kind of look at the core of the traffic log and it's, it's so much of kind of what we did forever. What all the great dealerships did is they really got focused on the digital side of sales, meaning the digital, the, the, dad, sorry, the data side of sales so that they can hold teams accountable and train them properly. And now, we're moving, we're in that situation in the digital side. So anyhow. Yeah. yeah. So a couple, a couple things. That's a great, great dialogue. So the, the traffic log, what you're talking about, whether we're talking about digital or physical and Aaron, you made the point that it's the heartbeat of the dealership and it is the most important yeah. document that you have inside of these stores because it measures opportunity, right? right? It's our scorecard. And if we're not going to keep score, why are we even playing the game? Right. right? We got NCAA tournament just kicked off. I guarantee you, if they weren't keeping scores in those games, much, many fewer people would watch those games. Yeah. Right. So let's keep yeah. score. Let's get our people in the game. So that's one. Your comments got hilarious. Right. I use that line. Somebody comes up, right, with the worksheet and they'll buy at this, but there's nothing written down. And I just smile at them and say, you know what? I can't hear, but my vision's 2020. So, right, show me something. I read great, but I don't hear very well at all because they'll tell you anything, but if it's not written down, I got nothing. So that's one. But part of this walk down memory lane, if you will, on traffic logs is to illustrate the point that we use those paper logs. And Aaron, you talked about cycle trader and print right? Yellow pages ads. Okay. We think about if we had to operate business today with yellow pages and paper traffic logs, that's a foreign concept. But at yeah. the time when somebody said, Oh, there's an electronic traffic log that we're going to call a CRM. Well, what do you think about that? And you're like, oh, I don't know, man, I got the paper. I should be fine. Well, we have CRMs now that is reinventing yourself because the business is evolving, right? When we move from yellow pages to you need to advertise on Facebook and there's something called social media. And you're like, I don't understand. Any, what are you talking about? Right? I don't even understand that. It. It's uncomfortable to make those moves. We're in one of those spots where there's a bit of discomfort for our dealers in general, because it's a bit unknown. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit at the end because it's not as unknown as you think it is out there. So um, anyway, Dealers that didn't make that evolution and didn't reinvent themselves, that are still working with some archaic tools, are not as competitive, not as relevant, and probably just not around anymore as the dealers that keep. So I just wanted to use that just from kind of an analogy that, again, great businesses continually reinvent themselves. We're at a point in time where that is that is required right now. So, John, I mean, one cop, just one quick comment. That, yeah. that change is tough. I mean, I, I actually distinctly remember it like it was yesterday where you know we, we we were we were we had a kawasaki dealership west coast motorsports right here in fort, fort myers and we had paper logs like we talked about and salespeople they had worksheets they put them in three ring binders you know we would do power hour follow-up they'd have to go in in their desk and at their desk and they were you know they would grind that big huge i mean how big was that phone back then i mean the phone filled up half the desk <laughs> And they're sitting there and they're dialing out, right? And following up. I mean, there was no texting customers then. Uh, you know, you're just calling, calling customers and mailing cards. Um, but I remember distinctly when we first introduced the CRM concept inside the dealership. 
that was a, that was, you know, you remember that, Scott? I mean, that was a big transition to get people to think differently. And it was about, you know, be able to have better data and it's and, and be able to access it better and all, all these different things, right? And, and even that change, this is, I'm probably talking about 2003, maybe, 2004, but I think the, the reason that it's hard to, to kind of adapt and change like you're talking about, and we can, re- and that's just great reflection that we just went over is, you know, it's, it, it, it is hard, you know, it's hard to get your team, your staff and, you know, your dealership and, and all that. But why did we do that? We did that because we wanted to, uh, you know, really improve the customer experience. Yeah. Well, it's, look, we can do a different, a different podcast on why change is hard, right? Because with change comes loss and we're not going to go down that path because that's easily an hour and we don't, mm-hmm. we're not going to take the time for that today. We'll put that on the list for, for the next one. Um, so anyway, so this evolution, what we're talking about, right, is customers are, are customers are just living more online. Okay. And, and again, it doesn't matter what you're shopping for. People just go that way. And we've talked in past podcasts about why that's happening. Some of it's generational. Okay. Younger people, that's all they know is to go online first. Okay. Um, there's, there's a piece of it that's that way. Um, COVID accelerated some of this digital retailing uh, quite significantly as well. But anyway, what, what's really happening right now, and I think the, what I want to spend the next few minutes talking about is the battle for the customer inside of the segments in the space we're talking about the battle for the customer is being fought online okay yep. when you think about that online and we've shared several times and we compare data with our with our friends over at garage composites particularly on on customer behaviors and so forth but one thing that we've known for a while that comes out of polk industries right we've shared this stat before is 95 percent of people in the power sports mostly in the vehicle space they start their journey online Okay, that's not a new data point. We know that. But there's we can peel back the onion a little bit more and think about well, what are they doing while they're online, okay? So they spend a we're talking 8 to 10 hours on average, okay, of online, I'm going to call it research, okay? Yeah. And there's there's two components when I say this consumers move from a research phase to a shopping phase at some point. Okay, they do their research and research is, hmm, am I interested in this community and this lifestyle and this activity, if you will, right? Whatever it is, you pick, pick your pick your vehicle of choice and insert it in that, in that. So consumers are like, hmm, maybe I wanna do that. And they start to get excited. So they're looking at OEM websites and they're looking at um, uh, 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 different product forums and they're just, they're trying to decide if they want to be involved in this. That's research. At a certain point, they're going to say, you know what, that's not for me. And they bow out. Okay. If they don't bow out, then they move into a shopping phase. Okay. So now they're starting to figure out, I've kind of determined what segment I want. I've got a pretty good idea what brand I'm after. Now I need to start thinking about where would I do my business? Okay. So now they're looking at dealership websites and they're looking at review websites about those dealerships. They're going through all these different things because ultimately what they're trying to figure out is where's the one store I'm going to go and try to make this purchase happen. Okay. Because I don't have an exact percentage, but we're, we believe we're about 40% of all of these people that we're talking about. Ultimately, when they decide they're ready to engage in person, they visit one store. One store. Okay. Some of them visit two, but a high percentage of them visit only one. So when I say the battles being fought for that customer online, it's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. So the OEM sites have to be good. Your own reviews have to be good because OEMs need to drive interest in the sport and in the activity and in their particular brand and community. And they need their obligation, I believe, is to drive consumer interest in their product. Great. The dealer's responsibility is to, um, uh, in a very meaningful way, represent the brands they carry, but they're also fighting the location battle. Because if I'm one of those people and I'm spending that time online and I'm moving from research to shopping, I'm not just looking at one dealership website. No way. 
I'm reviewing multiple. I'm going to put leads into multiples of those. So we're competing as a dealer. I want to win that person to come. If I'm the one spot, I need to be the one place they're going to go. Okay. So that's all about engagement and website optimization and everything where we live, where Lead Helm lives is in that space. So I'm going to, Aaron, maybe you go and then Scott, you're nodding your head or whoever wants to go first. But Aaron, talk a little bit about, because talk a little bit about where, where we really live, not so much our technology, but our philosophy on influencing the journey early. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I we've related some of the things of how they used to be inside the dealership, you know, and when we have, we have a very small amount of time to influence a customer when they first walk into our dealership, right? And a lot of times it's 15 seconds or so. You know, they walk into the dealership, if there's trash all over the floor, there's staff, you know, smoking cigarettes on the side of the building, and there's really nobody that's eager to greet them. We really just influence the customer. And when you influence a customer, you influence them positively or negatively, right? So, yeah. you know, um, versus, you know, they walk into a dealership and they get a loud, you know, hoorah and a big, big greet from staff across the dealership. And, you know, the, there's rock and roll music jamming and the product sparkling clean and it's all set up nicely. And, you know, there's staff that are eager to talk to them and are excited that they're in the dealership. You know, big, big difference there. And, you know, when you talk about meeting the customer where they're at, you talked about a lot of things right there, John, from a data perspective. <laughs> Most customers are starting online, right? There's reasons for this. And it's not, and I think everybody, I think John, Scott, you guys would agree with me. Customers want to go into the dealership. They want that the experience. So that's not, I don't think that's what we see as fading away is that they just want to click buttons and have the bike delivered online. They want that experience to go in, but they want to make sure that, you know, they're doing it on their time, that they're more in control, and they want to be more educated. So when they do come in, they can have, they can save time and have a streamlined experience. You know, they still want to come in and hang out with the staff and they still want to come into events and, you know, participate in all these things. But when you saw, when you talk about meeting the customer that where they're at and influencing the journey, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we have to, we really, we really have to make sure that we're responding properly, that we're answering their questions directly, right? We don't, they don't want to be beat around the bush on maybe what they're asking, um, you know, it's, you know, the, the, when you break down those percentages of how communication goes, right, they, they want to deal with somebody that's excited on the other side of the, of the phone or, or the text, and they want to deal with somebody that can answer their questions easily so that they can, you know, start to kind of move through that process. Customers in this stage early on, I think there's a few things that they're deciding. You said a couple of them, but you break it down and it's, okay, is this the brand? Is this the place and is now the time? Mm -hmm. And I think we forget as a dealership, we, we the, the customer, in my opinion, is always in control to a certain level. I mean, you can't, you can't control every customer. And that's not what it's, it's really not about controlling that customer. It's about nurturing them, right? They're on a journey. I don't want to sell a moose. I want to sell a lace stuff. I want to sell, I want to sell the passion behind why all of us are in this industry. Get them excited about it. But and I think I think the we forget we we as dealerships do have um, more than we think about how we can influence customers that we do have the right brand. We sell great product, great brand or brands in some cases for let's say a power sports dealership. Um, am I the place? Gosh, I, I I would hope that we are right, and I think. You know, there's a lot of things that I have to do as a dealership to to really make sure that customer knows that we are the dealership for you. And when it comes to timing, um, that's one of those things that, you know, it's there's a lot of reasons to 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 wait. And, and my job is to really make sure that I'm giving you all the things you need so that you can make a, a decision, you know, faster, you know. And um, so there's a lot there's a lot more, I think, to that. But the customer. I think of the old yellow pages. We said it earlier. We used to say that all the time in our sales meeting. When they're the, the one of the most important things at that time was when that phone rang. If the phone wasn't ringing, it was the person that pulled pulled into your dealership, and you were greeting them out there and talking about you know what they rode in on. But when the phone rang, 
we have to we we had to admit to ourselves that we're not the only place they're calling. They're no. calling, and we used to look at the remember that we used to pull the phone book out and you'd pull the dealerships out, and they'd go from A to Z, and you'd be shocked that gosh, this thing goes from five counties. I mean, they're you know list of dealers this long. So when you said about picking one place, I don't think that's a problem. I think that's an op, that's one of the biggest opportunities we've ever had in the in the market is is that we we they've got more tools, I've got more tools, and we can we're the place. So I get excited about that question. Well, I think it's just in in what you're really going after there, right? Customers are telling us they want to start online, so we've yeah. got to meet them there. And they're going to reach out to us on occasion, right? Because they're going to come to your website multiple times. Most likely, data says they'll visit your website a few times before they actually raise their hand and say, I'm interested in what you have and give us some information so we can communicate with them. But as soon as they raise their hand on your site and Scott on your site and on my site, okay, whoever gets to them first whoever gets to them the best and whoever stays with them the longest is going to win the appointment at the one place they go. And that's right. our whole, that's our whole life right now. How do we help dealers win that battle? So let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about the difference, right? So we understand now what the consumers are doing. They're, they're, they're pushing this evolution and it's our option to go with them or get left behind. End of the day. That's, that's really the deal. So, some of the similarities, right? Because we're going to paint a picture that the online piece, the digital environment and what we're doing there is different than the physical in the store, right? Customer visit in the showroom. But let's hit the similarities first, right? Sometimes what we're trying to do that, that are common, whether somebody walks in the front door or calls us or, or we get an online lead, right? We're talking about relationship building at this point. We're talking about trust. Same thing like a greet on the showroom floor. We don't greet customers and talk about product right away. We talk people before product, okay? Customer salesperson relationships are contentious. People to people relationships are great. Let's create a person to person relationship online. That's fine, that's very common. Um, we need to bring emotion, right? Aaron, you said the lifestyle, the passion, we need to put that in to our words and to our texts and to our videos that we're sending, something to elicit excitement that, look, this is not a commodity. There's, this is a living, breathing thing you're getting into. So we've gotta be able to, to, to do that. And we're, we're, we're really representing our brand. So the brand can be product you're selling, it can be the dealership, it can be yourself. You're representing all those things online, just like we do on the floor. And I think the other one we, we lose sight of sometimes, and you guys will chuckle, our old, our old mentor, Ed Lemko, right? We used to talk about customer-driven business versus salesperson-driven business. And that was a, a discussion on staffing the showroom floor with the right number of salespeople. I'm not going to cover that today. But the same thing happens with digital leads, okay? Most dealers today are reasonably good at responding to a lead that comes in digitally. And if the customer wants to have a conversation, we do a pretty good job of having that conversation and trying to drive this customer to an appointment, okay? But the customer that goes quiet, that doesn't want to engage, most of the time, that's like the guy that just walks in and says, I'm just looking and we just leave him alone because we're understaffed on the floor. We have to have people dedicated to follow up, continually try to get these customers to re-engage. That is salesperson driven business. That's where the magic comes. That's where the incremental sales growth comes from is on that side of it. So those are some of the common things that we're trying to do between digital and physical. Shifting the unique things, okay, that happen in digital. Now, a little caveat, some of you will do full e-commerce with vehicles, right? We're going to negotiate deals. We're going to do credit ads. We're going to do trade appraisals. We're going to do all that. And then we may, if it's a used product, we may ship it somewhere and we do everything electronically. Great. That's still a small percentage of our business and that's okay. So we're going to address the bigger percentage of our businesses where the online engagement, we're really trying to do everything that Aaron just said, right? Relationship, build value, great product, 
We are the place. Now is the time. Come in and see it, feel it, touch it, experience us, meet your new friends, all, right, all that stuff. And the, 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 the process that we have over there, right, that's a bit different, which means our metrics are different. I'm not measuring greets and I'm not measuring sit downs and write ups and so forth over in the digital area, right? I'm measuring response times. I'm measuring the number of engagements that we have. How many touches does it take to move a lead from, hey, I'm interested in what you have to a kept show and appointment? I'm looking at set appointments. I'm looking at kept appointments. So if we have a different set of data, different KPIs, because it's a different sales process over there, that's why we have it digital traffic log that we've done in, in one of our episodes as well over there. And so we got different skill sets. We have different technology. We have different coaching. And this is different management, right? Belief, what we're trying to get across here in this new thinking for leaders in power sports, marine, auto, we have to think about this a little bit differently. We have to believe that the processes are different. We have to adopt those processes and manage them independently. So <clears throat> just a couple things, okay? <clears throat> Aaron, for you, let's talk about staffing for a minute because I want to hit this head on because this is a reality right now, particularly inside of Power Sports <clears throat> and Harley Davidson, right? Turnover is high, okay? The yep. average Power Sports and Harley dealer in 2023, their turnover a dealership as a whole is over a hundred percent. I believe, but yeah. that means the front end is usually the highest of that. So we've got sales departments there that are churning at 120, 130, 150%. And new people are hard to find. Okay. So, and then we're coming in saying, oh boy, you've got to have some people to manage these leads. And sometimes it's not adding bodies, it's repositioning bodies from the sales floor to handling the internet side, right? So I'm not talking about an increase in headcount necessarily, but I want you to share for a minute, Aaron, if you would, on your experience with, you ran our internet sales department, right? Oh. Out of the Harley store in Fort Myers. You did it for multiple stores. And what I want you to really talk about, because what I'm encouraging dealers to think about, because staffing is a challenge. Digital lead follow-up. Digital lead management can be done offsite very successfully. Technology exists to do that. So if you're in a market of whatever size and you're only casting your employee net in your market, that might be a bit short-sighted right now, right? You could have your net go everywhere with the right technology and oversight and visibility to performance and allow this segment of the business to happen somewhere else quite successfully. So people are a little bit scared of that. People are a little bit yeah. fearful of moving that offsite. So Aaron, you some experience can you share when you you were doing that right right in the middle of the right in the middle of the mix there? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. You said like you said, John, it's a different it's it's the the skill sets are different. Right. And so and, and so when we started dedicating staff to this process, which is step one, I mean, they know what you, know, you got to have the dedicated people to do that. We learned that there was a high level of distraction for those individuals inside the dealership. And what I mean by that is, is that you'd have, you know, salespeople coming in and wanting to try to cherry pick off of, you know, the activity that was happening there. You had sales managers coming in and wanting to say, hey, I need help moving motorcycles and, you know. Their job was to be on the phone, ringing them for dollars, texting for dollars, and building building relationships with customers. So, you know, we actually had to really try to isolate that, and 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 we actually saw that we could get higher performance from that kind of that isolation. So that's 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 one big thing. The other big thing was, you know, hey, uh, you know, a customer needs um, needs a couple tires put on and uh, needs needs a couple adjustments if, for their brakes. But I don't have a technician, so you know what? Let's let me let me go pull a salesperson off and see if they can get that job done. No, we have dedicated people to dedicated things inside the dealership, just like we do with sales and F and I. And so, you know, yes, skill sets are different, and yes, you know, having them laser focused in one lane is important. Just like we again, I'm using examples, F and I. You don't have F and I, you know, um, at the parts counter unless you need help. Their job is to be followed up with customers, and when customers come to the office to maximize uh, that opportunity. 
The reason that remote work, like what you're talking about, John, can be really effective is one, you've got a bigger pool or a bigger pond to fish from. And the skill sets, and that's another conversation from their time, or well, what are those skill sets? But they're, they are different, um, different than your motorcycle on the floor salesperson today. And when we train and we hire that way, we now have somebody that's specialized in this. They're specialized in nurturing a customer, building a relationship. And what's their goal? To set appointments. Well, if they're not inside your dealership, we get kind of scared of that. We say, man, how could that be possible? Because we're so used to having to be able to see people sometimes to manage them. But the, but the cool thing is, if you've got the right tools that tell you all the information and give you all the data, you don't need to see them because you can see everything that's being done every day, every hour, every month, every quarter of a year, right? Because we're inspecting what we expect and we have accountability to the data. And, you know, what, when we had DLP, and I'll just say this last thing, I just, to kind of put a little proof in the pudding of this, we had Scott and I, and I we're, we, we still have it, 8,000 square foot office. When we saw that we could give our staff a better life, a better day at work by being able to work remote, and we saw we could get more productivity and we could get better results, which all came probably down to that customer experience. And we were like, wow, well, that, that was actually a big transition for us. And we learned that if we if we if we manage the data and we manage the process, we can get better results. So I encourage any dealer that's listening to that to say, oh man, that sounds really difficult. Well, if we give them the tools, you could have you could have somebody working, you know, four states over here and five states over here and three states below you. Um, and it and it can be done in today in today's world. So yeah. No, I think that's that piece of it. Right. One, we have the ability technologically now to allow this. Right. So we get the oversight and the accountability from afar, which is fine. But I think the big piece is the distraction. Right. Being in a dealership is exciting, but it also can be very distracting. And we're to a point where I need people focused on these digital leads all the time because the nurturing process takes a lot longer than most people think. The number of touches required to move somebody from, hey, to, yeah, I'm ready for an appointment, that takes a lot longer and a lot more intensity than people right. realize. And again, that's where sales people driven business if we do it right that's where we get the incremental lift in volume that i think most dealers would love to have right now so scott how you feeling about all this you got any, you got any thoughts on this one anything so oh, far just just a couple of thoughts Tom. just a couple usually, right? don't, usually don't usually don't have enough time to talk about my thoughts but you know i i, I think <laughs> what i would like to share as quickly as possible is so much of what Aaron talked about and you talked about, you know, whether it's, you know, um, the, how we stay with the customer, how we acknowledge the customers first, all the, all the process online, Aaron talked so much about the dealership inside the dealership, all these things, these are all part of running a great business, um, preparing for the customer. Um, and, and you know it's 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 critical, but I think what I'd like to say is you know obviously we're very involved in this digital process through to through lead uh, through lead helm, but I'm still a dealer, you know I'm still a, I'm still a Harley dealer with two yeah. very strong dealerships, and I would just tell you that you know I just had financial reviews for. For for year to date for, through February, and you know it, it's it's a tough market right now. I mean, you know, I mean, not it's not just us. We just had a twenty club too. You know, sales are down substantially throughout the country. Profitability is like you know, I mean, it's scary. I mean, I've been a dealer a long time. We've been a very profitable dealer, and we've been a dealer that struggled. I mean, we've seen both sides of it. But I'm going to tell you, though, the one thing, clear and simple, that we come to the conclusion of during those financial reviews is, what does our traffic log look like, and what's the performance look like in that traffic log? 
Yeah. What's, what's the digital, what's the digital traffic log look like? And I'm, you know, look, it is when 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 we're not getting fifty percent of the of the customers to come through the door that are online, there's a problem. You know, our online customers, the people that come through digital, you know, we, we see we see an average of fifty percent of those customers we, we make an appointment. And you know, all I can say is, as the general manager, one of the things we hear so often is, "Well, I don't have anybody to do this, or I don't have anybody to do that." You know. We have sales managers in our stores. We have general sales managers. And we have to hold people accountable to this type of stuff. Even, yep. even the transactions. You know, we talk about transactions mm -hmm. in, the, in the dealership, mostly in the parts and motor clothes. Well, you know, as a general manager or a dealer principal, I want to be able to say to the parts manager, what are you doing to help facilitate those customers from the motor clothes department or the parts department over to the sales department. That's why we look at transactions. You know, we want to get 25, you know, one in 25, one customer out of 25 transactions. You know, yep. so anyhow, I'm, I'm, I'm talking like a dealer, not as a, as, as a technology company, but it is technology that is, allows us to really look at this information. And if we're yep. not doing that, I, you know, honestly, I just don't know. I don't know what else people should be doing in the business because it's a tough business. It's even when it's good, it's tough. I mean, yeah. we run a very complicated business. I mean, multiple departments, all this stuff going on all the time. But, you know, it's not difficult to track th these data points, but you got to have them in place to do it. So that's, you know, yeah. That's I, I well, can't, you know, Aaron knows this from the time we've been in this. Yeah. I always come back to him kind of like a dealer. What about this, Aaron, you know, as a dealer? I think like that as a dealer, you know, as, as, as how does this help us as a dealer? So, you know, so, so um, good stuff. Yeah, you know, Scott, those are, it, it's great to get the, the, the dealer piece of it, right? And, and again, I've seen some of the, some of the performance numbers through, through February as well, right? So. You know, we, we've got some opportunity on, on digital and, and for most uh, it's it's needed right now. So let's you're, we, we've talked a lot about the data and let the data lead us. So I want just visually to, to think about this in your as, as we as we try to get across this new thinking. Right. You guys know what Venn diagrams are. Right. So you got the circle over here and a circle over here. And there's a little space in the middle where they overlap. I want you to start thinking about the front end of your business that way where I've got mm. my digital side over here that's a circle and I've got my floor traffic side yeah. over here that's a circle and there is a bit of overlap and that overlap is when we get a a set appointment and now I've got to move all my information and all the trust that I've developed online over here I've got to move that over so that my sales team can be prepared for that appointment that's coming okay so I want you to visualize it that way the Venn diagram but the data why we're so particular i want i want these separate i want the data segmented right i want my own digital kpis over here and i want my floor traffic log information over here because as we've said the steps are different and the metrics are different okay i need to have insights from the data so i can coach and change behaviors so that we can get better performance okay i can't change the data but i can let the data tell me what i can do differently behaviorally and that's the goal and part of the reason I'm going to give you a quick story here on why that segmented data is so important. Mm -hmm. Some of you guys and gals out there may may know this one, but this goes back many, many, many years ago, and it's called the Hawthorne Experiment. OK, it's actually something that was done by Western Electric, who's a lighting light bulb manufacturing company. It's called the Hawthorne Experiment because it was done in a suburb of, of Chicago that they call the Hawthorne area. Anyway, here's the story. Western Electric believes that lighting, because that's their business is lighting, they believe that lighting can impact positively or improve factory production work. Okay, so if you're a factory, you're making, you're making cleats or you're making footballs or whatever you're making, factory line production. They believe if lighting goes up, performance will go up. So they wanna do a study. So they pick this, this, uh, this, this, uh, this, this Hawthorne factory. And they go in and 
they measure production, okay? Under current conditions, no problem. They measure production and it's at X, great. They go in, they change out all the lighting, they put the new lighting in so it's much brighter and so forth. And they go in and they measure production again. It goes up. They're like, oh, we're onto something. If we can prove production goes up, we're gonna sell a whole pile of light bulbs. Great. Yep. As a control to the experiment, they have to go back in and put lighting back to its original level, right? So they take the new bulbs off, they put the old bulbs back in, they do that, they measure production. It goes up again. Has nothing to do with lighting. Nothing to do with lighting. Attention and focus on production improves production. That's the whole point of this. Segment the data. Look at response times, look at set appointments, look at the number of touches, not just new leads, but all the leads in the system, all your leads under management, how often are they getting touched? Dissect that data, train people, coach people, you will improve. I'm not saying you have to spend more money to drive more leads. I'm saying if you focus on this and you think differently and you act differently, you'll sell more with the leads you already have. Right. Okay? So that's, that's Hawthorne. And to carry it further, bring those two different data sets to your create a deal meeting every morning and talk mm -hmm. about them differently. Because at some point, these people over here that are setting the appointments are going to create opportunity for these people over here. That's the intersection part of the Venn diagram, but we have to keep them separate. We have to keep them separate. So I'm going to turn it over to the boys here for any feedback. Scott, yeah. you no, go. So I just want I just want to comment on on that because you, know, you, know, you have that that center section, you know, and I think one of the beauties of the digital and sales side separate is you know the training and the process is different on both sides. So looking yep. at the data points from each side allows the owner or general manager to focus on what type of an, who how am I going to train this this digital team better. We've got good data points now. You know, we know what percentage of customers should make appointments and what percentage of customers should show up and what percentage of customers will buy. We have a fairly good industry standard for those for those numbers, targets for those numbers. So there's something to, to look at to, to be, you know, I want to be the best. I mean, I always wanted to be the best dealer. And one of the ways that you measured being the best dealer was could you get the 15 or 16 or 17 percent net profit? You know, because right. the best deal, the, you know, in a 20 club, the best dealer really was the guy with the biggest net profit. You know, and it's, overall, you did everything right. And, you know, those the investment in both those sides is so important. But what's the beauty of it is, is that the center one keeps getting bigger and bigger when you do a good job with it. You know, I mean, the, 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 the performance, which, which really comes out of the uh, in between the overlap is what we're trying to do. And. You know, we just need a much higher concentration. Level. And then last, lastly, I just want to say, you know, Aaron will tell you, or he's maybe said it before, when we were with digital lead performance and we were doing full service BDC work for dealers, it was a very good product. We did a great job. Customers loved it because quite frankly, they didn't have to do all this stuff we're talking about. We did it for them. Right. But it was right. expensive. And we we realized through the process that even our lead our lead our lead uh, our lead management team was not giving us factual information they were right. still giving us information that made them look good has anybody ever heard that from their sales team before has a salesman ever lied to you and told you that he, no. he did ask the customer no. something but but no. the fact is is that this made us create lead home because we wanted to have the ability to have accountability in the process because accountability is what allows us to train teams and get, make them better and get better results. So um, I, I think that, that it's, it's really exciting if dealers really look at the two great opportunities that exist in their sales yeah. department. One anymore. You think about it. It used to just be one. All we had was a sales team. To 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 you know to to get better. Now we've got multiple very very yeah. strong areas of the business to work on to get more customers in the store. 
it's that's I, yes, Scott. The, vis, the visibility to this, right? We the, the the right technology improves the lives of our employees. It increases capacity. There's a positive ROI on it, and and again, it's it historically was more difficult to play in the space because we didn't have the right tools and we didn't really understand it. And we do now. So I'm going to, I got one, one more, one more story. Uh -huh. I love to tell a story. And so I got, I got to give a little, some, uh, a shout out to one of my, probably my first real professional job and the boss that I had, Harry Friedman. Um, and Harry's a retail guy, wrote, wrote a great book, says, no, thanks. I'm just looking very classic sales training book, but, um, the the Hawthorne experiment was a was a story I learned in working with Harry, and this one is also one that I learned in, in working with Harry. But so, right, we're we're at a point right where we've got something different. We're asking dealers to think about, and we're asking them to adopt a different process, and it's a bit unknown, right? It's a bit unknown, or or maybe it's not. So here's the story: uh, airplane crashes on a deserted desert island. Okay, and amazingly. Everybody survives, which is the good news. Uh, but they realize that the radio and all that stuff is broken and they don't have any way to communicate. And they start to think, well, we might be here for a little while. So we need to start divvying up who's going to do things, right? So we had some people that are, you know, in charge of, we got to build shelter. We got some people that are trying to figure out water and some people trying to figure out food and some try to people to figure out um, uh, just how we, how we going to live, right? How do we, how do we live, right? And they, they soon realized that we're going to need somebody to be a doctor here on the island. And so they ask, anybody a doctor? Nope, nobody's a doctor. Okay, nurse? No, nope, no, no, no. Anybody want to volunteer to be the doctor? And they had this young guy who said, you know, I was really good and enjoyed my science classes in high school. Um, so I'll volunteer to be the doctor. So I go, Great, you're the doctor. Okay. So he gets, he finds some paper and some stuff inside the plane and he's ready. He sees his per first patient and the patient comes in and he's got this weird pain in his lower right side of his abdomen there, right? Which we probably know now is probably an appendix issue, but this guy doesn't know. He has some science classes. So the guy's like, I got a pain right over here. So kid doctor takes the guy's tonsils out, right? Patient dies. So he writes in his book, don't do that. Okay. <laughs> A little bit later, patient comes in, same kind of pain over here. He's like, all right, goes back to his book. He says, all right, well, don't take the tonsils out. So he doesn't take the tonsils out, right? But he, you know, decides he's going to do a little operation on the guy's elbow for whatever reason. So he does an operation, doesn't work, guy dies, makes a note. So after several years, this, this book and all these notes, this volume continues to figure out, and he starts to get it. So finally, somebody comes in, and they got that pain, and he goes, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. So finally, he figures out, maybe if I put a little incision there and look inside and see what's going on, he figures out, oh, there's this inflamed thing, takes it out, sews them up. That was the appendix. Guy lives, makes a note in his book, right? This is all great. One day, the doctor dies. Okay, doctor dies and they have to look for a new doctor on the island. So somebody else volunteers, I'll be the doctor. The new doctor now has two choices of what to do when the first patient comes in. They either begin again by trial and error and kill a bunch of people or read the book. Okay, I challenge you right now. You have two choices in this discussion that we're having about new thinking. You can go it alone through trial and error or you can work with us because we have the book on this. We understand and we live in this space. So you can do it either way, right? Let's not kill a bunch of people. Let's read the book. We can read it together. So just love that little story. Love that. I love it right? every time you tell it, you know, it's a good one. What every time, Aaron, you make me feel like I tell our stories over and over. Look, I don't need new material. Yeah, I, I just need it. new audience. I've known it for 15 years. You can only have so many stories, man. <laughs> not sir. That's not That's so true. <laughs> uh, anyway, guys, I'm going to, any final comments from either of you guys? Then go ahead. And if not, I'll just put a little summary. We'll put a bow on this thing and we'll, we'll, we'll move on with, uh, with our day here. I got a quick thing and then I'll let you, Scott, go, go last if that's all right. So I think, I think the big thing we talked a lot about today is, you know, we talked about, you know, the evolution of, you know, the, the customer and the, and the business. And, you know, I love what you said when we first kicked off, you know, we're not, 
the in dealerships, we, lead helm. We're, we're not trying to change it. It's the customer, you know, the customer, and that's not a that's not a bad thing, right? But the customer and the way that they shop and the way they buy and they make the the way they make decisions is uh is changed, and it, it'll continue to change. I think what's really awesome is the opportunities that, that exist yeah. because of it. If I look at the opportunities that existed 20 years ago, there's a lot of them in today's world and what we can do to leverage that. And we're talking a lot about some of the data and the way you sell. So, I mean, marketing is a whole nother thing. There's so many awesome things you can do inside the marketing side of this. And, you know, I got just two fast quotes that I, and one I use, probably I use more than I should because I say it too many times. But when you talk about that story you just said, you know, and it stands true more than I think it ever has. It'll continue. Is, is that if we, if if we don't change the way we do business, our customers will change who they do business with. That quote really fits well in today's yep. conversation. Exactly. And you know, yep. we as a dealership, if you're a dealer principal, you're you know, equity is a really great word. You know, brand equity, equity in the market. You know, um, you know, market share, all those things. You know, let's go back to what really matters in this business, and that's equity of relationships. That's what a lot of what we're talking about. Have an equity of all the relationships of the people. I mean, think about that. If you were located here as a dealership and you've got 10 other dealerships around you, I mean, wouldn't it be great to go to sleep good at night knowing, you know what? You know what I have different than every other dealership around me? Equity and the relationships of all these people that live in this community. That's, that's powerful because... What, because and then I got one last quote and then I'll, then I'll shut up here on this, this great great <laughs> session. But I'm going to steal this one and share it. This is from Thomas Manning at Star Performance Marketing. Yeah. I love this. Amen. Yeah. He says, "I'm going to try not to butcher this, Thomas. If you're listening, no means no, not ever. It simply means no, not yet. I love that because go back to the equity, the relationship, and this and that, and what we're talking about and why digital lead follow up." and why nurturing a customer is so important. Yeah, we want to sell more product. Scott, you said it, it's one of the most important things we have to do is find and have and sell product so that we can be fruitful in all those areas. But you, you come in, in 21 years I've been in this industry, there's been times where, gosh, you, you can't get enough of them. And there's been times where, gosh, I've, I've got a lot of inventory and it's tough. Maybe it's financing and different things are tough. but. If we always have that equity in that relationship and nurture the customer, this is a this isn't a just an everyday. Are we going to win or not? I mean, this is a long game that we're we're in. You know, we've got a you know, it's not just a a, a thirty day window. You know, look further down the path and and um, anyhow. So great, 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 great discussion today. Sorry, Scott, I'll let you I'll let you go here. Good stuff, Amy. Yeah, look, I, I just um, I think that uh, it's it's um, it's important to say that uh, you know we we exited a big part of our business about six years ago or seven. Years ago. I can't remember now, John, how long it's been. Um, yeah, but right, right. You know, we decided through Aaron's um, interest to stay um, it, uh, in the in the in the power sports business to the digital side. You know, we saw this with our group of dealers. Uh, we run a full, full, you know, e-com um, BDC in that business where Aaron was taking the credit apps and he was lining up the deliveries. I mean, it was the whole ball game. But when we sold, we said, hey, you know, we, we, we feel the industry really, really needs this. And, um, and you know, and I think in part, um, we really thought we could, we could, we could help the industry. We could lead the industry in, in a, in a direction that's happening today. And in fact, there are some things that are proof around that already. You know, um, we probably have the biggest data source of performance or information in digital in the digital side than anybody in the in the industry has. You know, from a stand, from a standpoint of the sales side of the business. And you know, um, we elected to build technology around this because it's such a big business. It, it, uh, you know, the, the, it's such a big process to be able to have hundreds of dealers become better digital sales companies and the, the ability to manage that um, as a full service was very difficult and we we elected to go to, uh, to go 
digital, build technology for it. And look, it's sometimes it'd be easy to say it's easier just to be a dealer. But the reality of it is the dealers need digital performance. And I think that we're, we're you know, we're building that platform that will help um, help the industry um, do a better job at it. And it's exciting. It's exciting what we uncover every day. And, you know, last night we got an email from Harley. And Harley Davidson once is asking a question. Do you have a, a BDC person? Do they know what to track? Does, 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 I mean, it was so elementary of what they were asking. I was, I was shocked at how elementary it was they were asking, but that's what I mean by we're dealers, we're inside the industry. We're building and we're building a software and a and a and a and a digital sales strategy from the inside. And I hope that I hope that customers will realize that we're not just a bunch of tech guys, we're actually motorcycle guys using outside tech people to help us build the platform. But we're driving the process. Yeah. No, I think I think I think that's great, Scott. It 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 really is about that, right? A lot of this a lot of this stuff was developed for our own use and then for mm -hmm. use at DLP. But you know, one of the taglines for Lead Helm, right? And this is built for dealers by dealers. And I think that's that's your point, right? We under we understand, we're empathetic to what the world of dealership operations are today and as they continue to evolve. So just a quick Last point for me, right? We said it earlier, the battle for these customers, the customers you want is being fought online. Let us help you win that battle. We're really good at this stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, check us out, leadhelm.com online. You can go to the resources tab. You can get podcasts. You can sign up for the newsletter. All kinds of good nuggets, insights, and tips come from that. And the other thing, the next piece is, look, if you agree with us, let's talk about it. But more importantly, if you disagree with what we're talking about, I really want to talk to you because maybe we're missing something here. Maybe we've got some things to learn. So Ooh. if you've got a counterpoint, please reach out. I want to have that discussion because we're always open to learning and getting better uh, on our team. And hopefully you guys are too. So guys, Scott and Aaron, always a pleasure. Thank you. People that are listening, kudos to you for always being students of the game and taking time out of what's a hectic life and a hectic business to run to listen and to learn and to be ready to reinvent yourself and continue to be great. So on that, enjoy spring and have a great, great day. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.